I'm Arno. I am from ThinkCell. We are doing PowerPoint add-ins. We've got really cool ones that we made right with C++. And we are doing things like reverse engineering PowerPoint and writing layout algorithms. And uh, we have our own C++ library that, that's on GitHub as well, uh, where we really try to you know, improve on the standard library, so with lots of range stuff and, and so on. Uh, today, I want to talk about something else uh, that came across while we did all these things. Um, and these are R values and what C++ does with them. And you're going to be the judge at the end how much of a disaster it really is. Uh, oh, I got another cover slide. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about R values. Um, so when we got C++, we got the standard library, and uh, that was way back then. And it advocates value semantics. So everything's a value, and you put values into containers, and you, you move them around you, in, in, into containers and out of containers. And let, that led to frequent copying in C++03. So a long time ago in C++11, um, the standard came up with something called the R values, R value references. To, they were really invented to avoid all this copying. You could basically mark things as movable, and then when you copy them, you can steal the resources, and you don't have to reallocate the resources all the time. So it was really about efficiency. And here's an example. I mean, everyone knows that probably. So you have a vector of vectors, and when you want to and place another vector into the vector of vectors, if you write move around the vector, then you can steal the resources of the vector, and you don't need to reallocate. OK, that's all cool. Uh, but very early on, they actually started using C++ as the, uh, the R values, R value references, to talk about lifetime, to know something about lifetime. So when something is an R value, it's probably going to go out of scope pretty soon. And that was the reason in the first place that you could steal its resources because you wouldn't need them anymore. Um, but C++11 did CREF already, said, hmm, but if this is going out of scope pretty soon, then probably that's not a reference you want to keep around for a very long time because it's going to be dangling pretty soon. Um, so if you are constructing a STIT CREF, this, this reference wrapper from C++11, then it will only allow you to do that on L-value references and not on R-value references. Now with C++20 ranges, this whole thing became a whole lot more interesting. Uh, because suddenly, when you build a range, um, it's, it's lazily evaluated. So you, it takes a container, like here, the std vector, and then you filter this vector, and, and this filter is only engaged when you actually start iterating over the range. Well, that requires that the range has access to the vector, so internally, it will hold a reference to the vector, or to whatever container or reference it's filtering. The problem is when that reference goes out of scope, well, the reference is, uh, or the, the container goes out of scope, then the reference is dangling and you have a problem. So what they decided is, is to say, um, whenever you are building such a range when you're with, with a range adapter, when you're composing a range with a range adapter, that range should be an L value. It should be an L value reference because otherwise your, your reference would dangle pretty soon and you would, you would have a problem. So they really try to say, well, if you have an R value, that's something that lives for a short time. And if you have an L value, that's something that's likely to live longer. And there it's OK to package that into such a, a filter adapter. So uh, again, for R values, this whole thing doesn't compile. If you stick in, if you write what you write here, you have a std vector. Uh, that's an R value. It doesn't compile. Before we go more into details uh, regarding the R values for lifetime, let's talk about the R values for moving a little bit. Because there are some pitfalls, and since this is talk about R values, I just want to point out the little pitfalls that there are. Um, many of them maybe knew, know them already, but if you don't, well, here's a, here's a recap. So you have a constant A in your lo in the local function, and you try to move it uh, to efficiently return it from your function. Well, if A is const, unfortunately, as you probably know, you can't move out of a const, so this doesn't work. So uh, instead, you probably want to make it non-const and then move it. And uh, that's all nice and good. You get a move. The question is, is that the best we can do? And the answer is no, because there is a feature in C++ that's uh, 
when you when you don't do the move, right? When you remove the std move, um, that is called named return value optimization. So if you have a single variable in your pro, in your uh, function and that single variable that is returned, then the the, the compiler will actually put that variable already in the place where you, the, the, the return value should be put into. So it doesn't need to do anything. It's already in the right place. And interestingly, that moves if A is not, that, that works if A is, is non-const like it is here. It will also work if A is const. It's okay. And then even in the, if in the returned uh, A, that A is no longer const. So well, you can think about whether that's logical or not, but that's the way C++ is implemented. Well, that's, that's what the standard says. So here, this also works. You also get named return value optimization if your local variable is const. Again, no copy and move. Now, what happens if you have two branches in the code that essentially do the same thing? You are generating some sort of local A and then return it, or you generate a different A and then return that. Well, here, as I said, the named return value optimization will only kick in if you have a single variable that is being returned. Because only then the compiler can put that single variable in the place where that return variable is expected in the caller. And if there are two, it doesn't know what, which one it should pick, and then it doesn't do it at all. So there's no return value optimization, and you get a copy here because of the const. So that's probably not something you want. Now here, if you remove the cons again, you get a move, which is decently efficient. It's probably as good as it gets. Now, let's have a more special, uh, a, a special case. Uh, let's say that local variable is, is a struct, and it has a member, and you want to return that member from your local function, from your, from your function. Um, what happens here? Well, that return by itself, if that wouldn't be a member access, would invoke named return value optimization. Here it can't do that because B is likely going to be larger than the return value, so there's simply no memory provided by the caller to put that value into. So it will not do return value optimization. In addition, the return by itself will not make this thing an R value. So you actually get a copy. If you want this to be moved, unlike when you actually just have a return a, a regular variable, then you have to write to move around the B, around that, that struct whose value, uh, whose, whose member you are returning. That works uh, because if you have an R value struct, then the member access is actually also an R value. So R value members are R values. Okay, um, so here are the recommendations. If you have, if you are returning variables, just make them non-const. Um, because, yeah, maybe it works, you get named return value optimization even if they are const, but if you ever add a second branch and you don't pay attention, then suddenly you broke your optimization and you get a copy. So recommendation is don't make returned variables const. And you can use, uh, there's, there are warnings, w, move in Clang that lets you, lets Clang point out pessimizing moves. Okay, um, here's another little corner of the C++ language. Um, I'm going to talk about temporary lifetime extension, which now gets us to this lifetime topic that I alluded to originally. All right, so you have a struct B, and it has a member A, and you have an accessor that returns this A by const reference. Now, in the same code, you may have a similar structure C that also has a get A accessor, but it actually returns by value. And now on some generic code, you either have a B or a C, and you call it get A. So ideally what you would want is that if this is a value, then you get a value. If it's a reference, you don't want to make an extra copy, and then you want to get, get the reference. If you write it like this, with autoconstref uh, A, and then you just call either the value producing C dot get A or the reference producing B dot get A, then you actually, this will actually work. This will not dangle because of temporary lifetime extension. So the compiler will say, okay, you are assigning a pure R value, a value to that 
reference. And therefore, I'm not going to destroy your reference or your value that, that usually what could get destroyed when you, when you have your semicolon, when you, uh, when you end the statement, it would not, that would usually get destroyed, does not get destroyed. Guess it's lifetime extended so that your reference can still point to it, it will not dangle. This, is what, this, this idea, this, 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 this feature is actually predates C++ 11. It predates R value references. And it was the original idea of, okay, I can always write this constref and, and, and automatically the right thing happens. That's the idea. Well, let's see. Let's see how well this works. So here um, we have a simple struct uh, that again produces A's. And we have two of them that produce different A's, and we want the minimum of the, of the two. And, and they are less comparable, so everything is fine. So we run std min on the two A's that we are getting. And then we want to do temporary lifetime extension. We assign it to a const ref. Will this work? Well, let's look at the implementation of std min. Std min takes these two, uh, the two arguments by const ref and then returns a const ref. So essentially, when you're passing something into min, although it's an R value, it gets assigned to the const ref, to the L value references, and it gets returned by an L value reference. So that thing that you get returned is no longer a value. So the temporary lifetime extension looks at it and says, well, it's a reference already. There's nothing to whose lifetime I could extend. I'll just have a dangling reference now. So that's not good. All right, um, how can we improve that? How can we make this work? Let's see. Um, so if we rewrite the min to what we would probably do nowadays. I mean, std min is also older than C++11. So maybe now in the world of universal references and R-value references, we would probably do it differently. We'd probably say, okay, we take these two things by universal reference, and then we just forward them out to the func of the function so that, that whenever we can, you know, you have something that's an R value, we can still scavenge its resources once it has been passed through the min function. All right. Well, the problem is that when you're assigning this then to constref, then it still dangles because it will assign, even if it's an R value, that's fine, it will assign to the constref, but it's still a reference. It's an, it's an R value reference at this point. So there is no pure value whose lifetime could get extended, and you again get a dangling reference. Huh. Okay, now the only way to fix this is if the temporary lifetime extension would automatically somehow do a copy. Uh, maybe then we would, it would, could do that, right? The compiler could help you out and do it. Okay, but it doesn't. So right now, with the current standard, it's dangling. Here's another thing. Um, let's say we have again two functions, uh, some a and or some other a, um, and one returns by value and the other one returns by const reference. And again, we don't really know which one we're going to call. It's again generic code, and we want to do a forwarding return. We want to essentially call this function, and whatever it returns, we're going to pass out uh, out and return it from foo. This will work, that's fine. Um, the foo will exactly mimic whatever the return values are um, of some a. So if some a returns a value, it will return a value. If some a returns a const reference, it will return a const reference. So far, so good. But let's say you have some code in between. So you, are, you want to take this a, you want to do something else, and then we return the a. So how does it then look like? Question is, what do we put there? Right? When we are, when we are getting, getting the value back from, from some A, um, how do we declare the A so that when it gets returned, it's, it's all working? The value stays a value, the reference stays a reference. So again, the idea is, well, we have temporary lifetime extension, right? So then temporary lifetime extension has as a property that it's either a value or a reference, depending on what you're putting into it is a value or a reference. All right. Um, does that work? Well, unfortunately, if some a returns a value, then it will actually return a dangling reference. And if you then, so, so that, that's with decal type auto, if you put an auto there instead, then you have the problem that it always copies because the auto is always a value. So that's not good either. What's the real problem here? The temporary lifetime extension 
lies about its value. So when you, the sum A, the A there with a temporary lifetime extension will in effect be a value sometimes when you're putting in a value. But if, if asked by the type system, it will still say I'm a reference. It will not know that it's a value. And, and that's the problem. It's essentially with, with now generic code doing reasoning about the qualities of a type, it's not very helpful if, if someone is lying to you and giving you the wrong type effectively. So what shall we do? I would suggest deprecate the temporary lifetime extension. Forget about it. It's a, it's a pre-C++11 concept. Don't use it. It's dangerous. It, it will give you the wrong types and will surprise you with dangling references where you don't expect them. Now, what we really want is a variable that kind of behaves like, a tem like the temporary lifetime extension that is a value if you assign a value to it, and it's a reference if you assign a reference to it. And we can build such a thing. We can and macros to the rescue, right? So it, I, as far as I know, it can only be done with, with a macro. Um, we essentially do a, a conditional decayer that just decays our values. And when you plug in an L value, it will just spit out the L value. If you plug in an R value, it will decay it. And then we declare our variable with that type. We, we, we re repeat the, 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 um, the expression that we are gonna go, going to assign. We repeat it, find its, its type, decay it if it's, if it's an R value, and then use that as the type of our, of our variable that we are declaring, and then we assign our expression to it. Okay, so this how it looks like. So this, you're essentially then writing auto CREF instead of auto constref and hope for temporary lifetime extension. So this is how it looks like. So you have now the foo and it does an auto CREF A sum A, and then you do something with the A and then return it. That will all work because the A is now really a value um, if it's a value and it's a reference if uh, sum A returns a reference. And watch out, don't put parentheses here uh, because you really need to return, you, you need to know about the declaration type, not the expression type. So the declaration type is going to be a value. If you put parentheses out around it, it's going to be an L value reference, and uh, that's not what you want to return. Then you have a dangling reference again. All right, um, we, are, we make this our default auto. We use that a lot in our code. So whenever we, we, there's some generic assignment and it's const and, and we don't really know, we don't really care what's being returned, uh, and if it's an L value, then the L value reference, we just keep it an L value reference. And if it's a value, we make it a value. If you don't think about it, well, you just use auto CREF and, and automatically it works. So it, it's, it's nice. Uh, there's one little special case. Now, we chose to make the auto CREF always const. Uh, so you actually got a const value. So that essentially, no matter if you get a, a, uh, an L value reference that's const or the value that's const, whatever you're getting there is const. So your, your code essentially assumes that whatever you're having there is const. Um, and that, of course, is a problem if you want to return it. So in case of returns, we have a special auto CREF return that's, that's essentially for variables that you want to later return, and uh, that's then making values non-const. Okay. Now, with that, everything looks a whole lot better. So we have, again, a function our min, and that turns or passes the R values that you pass in out as an R value reference. And then we use it together with the auto CREF. The auto CREF will look at the R value reference, turn it into a value, and then you have a non dangling A. You, you, everything is safe, everything is fine. Okay. Now let's uh, look at this. If you have a structure B in C and it has a member, the, if you then create a PR value of B and then access the member, we already said that's an R value. So it will work just fine with auto CREF because auto CREF will look at it and say it's an R value and turn it into a value. So all is good. Now, let's say we want to program nicely and have an accessor. We don't, you know, accessors are nice. We're supposed to make them, write them so that we don't, we can't simply write into these public members. And accessors typically look like this. They return an IA constref. And uh, yeah, what could be the problem? Well, if you write this with auto CREF, um, A, B get A, then A is a const reference. And 
then since b is an r value, again, you get a dangling reference because the, the, the accessor returned you a const ref, which is again essentially lying about its type because it is not an L-value reference. It doesn't, live, it doesn't live long because B doesn't live long so and, and the member does not outlive its uh, containing type. So A is const ref and it dangles. Hmm. That's not good. Uh, you could try to embellish this a little bit, like say, okay, maybe I can put like some, some Pretty, prettiness to it, but it doesn't really make a difference if you're writing constref as the uh, modifier or if you're writing const, it's all the same thing. Uh, you still have the same problems. Now, the fundamental problem is that actually constref in C++ binds to anything. It binds to L values, but it also binds to R values. And that's a problem that essentially erases this lifetime knowledge that C++20 with the ranges actually is relying on. So people want to use C++ R value -ness as an indication of lifetime, but at the same time C++ erases that information. And this really affects anything that, we, that, that any, any accessor uh, that is, is qualified constref, um, and I think there are many, many out there, tons of them. Hmm. So that's a problem. Now let's look at this. Um, C++ itself <coughs> faces this problem. So let's say we have a ternary operator. And the ternary operator has two, gets two L-value references. Then, of course, what it will return is an L-value reference. It's a, the, the, if the, the two types are identical, then the return type is still the same type. So in case of L-value, you get an A const ref. If you plug in two R-values, then you get a, a const R-value reference. But what if you mix them? Let's say we're plugging in an R value and an L value, and uh, what's the decal type of that? A little quiz. Who thinks it's a const ref, a const ref? Who thinks it's an R value, a const ref ref? Who thinks it's something else? It's a const. Why a const? I don't know, because apparently they thought said oh, nothing really fits. If you make it a const ref, then it's it's not quite right, and if it's a const R value reference, that's also not quite right. Uh, let's better copy this thing, then we are safe, and everything is good. All right, so C++ uh, actually forces a copy there. It produces a PR value, a const one, for whatever reason. Now C++ twenty has a new trait uh, that is common reference. Um, it was invented for C++20 ranges. You have the problem there that if you are mixing, say you have a union range that has, takes two input ranges and, and kind of merges them together, uh, then the, the iterator, when you, when you dereference the iterator of this uni, unified beast, it somehow needs to know the type of that dereference iterator, the, the return value of that, or the return type of that dereference iterator. So one iterator, when, it deref when you dereference it, returns type A. The other one returns type B. What is that mixed iterator returning? And for that, there is the trade common reference. And we can do the same game here. You can also ask it. So OK, constref, constref is constref, constref, ref, constref, ref is constref, ref. No surprise. Now, what if you ask it in the mixed case? What does it do? It's constref, yippee. So it is also killing your r value And it doesn't copy. It behaves differently from the ternary operator. Why? Well, I don't know. Um, and, oh, let's say you have a common reference and you plug into a value and an l-value reference. Is that a big difference? No, that's an a. All right. Okay, um, so did common reference really embraces what I call R value amnesia? It loves it. So I'm just gonna forget about R value. So, ah, doesn't matter. Hmm. So the question is, what is really the problem? Where do things go wrong in C++ and how do we fix it? So here's the problem. 
Let's look at all this, this zoo of references that we have. We have constant ones, and we have non-const ones, mutable ones, and we have R values and L values. The lifetime is for R values is short, for L values is long, and then you have mutable, mutability, again, you, know, you have this whole, um, this, this, um, this matrix of different references. Now the question is, who is converting to what? What can you bind to what? And currently, C++ does this. Ah, there's extra information. If you have a mutable R value reference, you can scavenge it, which is something that you probably don't want to invent out of thin air. It's basically an extra property um, that you, you cannot make up from anyone else. Only this R value reference, mutable R value reference, has that property. So we can't just bind anything to this mutable R value reference because it, then we would think we can scavenge from it. Anyway, so. What does C++ do right now? Here's what it does. R values bind to, the, the, all the references always bind to their const equivalents. So far, so fine. I think that's indisputable. Now, the constant R value um, also binds to the constant L value. And there you're already getting R value amnesia. And then the mutable R value also binds to constant L value. So everything binds to constant L value. And you can see that with these arrows, we are, we are strengthening the lifetime promise. These arrows go from short to long, which, which can't really be. That, that can't be right. We need to point the arrows from the stronger promise to the weaker promise. So let's do that. Let's turn them around. This is how it's right. So the L values will bind to constant R value references. That's safe. That's perfectly fine. You just saying, okay, this is gonna go out of scope pretty soon. Well, maybe it doesn't, but you can still say that. It's not wrong. Um, nothing binds to the mutable R value because then you would, would be able to scavenge. But in, uh, in particular, the L value reference with long lifetime and mutability can also bind to the const ref. So essentially what you have is your, your const R value reference is your new const L value reference. That's how it should be. And then, then you are not strengthening any, any promises. You get less lifetime, less mutability, less scavengeability. So, um, and only the mutable L values, they bind to the constant L values. They don't strengthen anything when they do that. When they do that. This is how C++ should be. Oh, this is so sad. Oh, we made a mess. So uh, we dug ourselves a hole. Um, yeah, why did they dig this hole? Well, I don't know, maybe because of compatibility with old code. Could very well be, but this is what we have. So we can make an attempt to fix it. Um, and there's a warning, these are all ideas. I, and, and if you want to argue that they don't work, let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have this discussion. So, and here are the requirements. Certainly existing code has to continue to work. As always in C++, we must never break existing code. And we also have to be able to mix it. We can't change all the code at the same time. That won't work. We need to be able to do a piecemeal. Because otherwise, we're going to write, tell someone to throw away your code and, and come in, come on, go out with your old and come in with the new uh, all um, at once. That probably doesn't work. We need to be able to, uh, to do it gradually. So the idea is uh, any reference that we have in the code could either bind according to the new rules or the old rules. And the reference binding only happens at the beginning of a lifetime. So essentially, it's at the beginning of the lifetime we can decide new rules or old rules. And afterwards, since you cannot rebind references, it doesn't matter anymore. You're, you're, it's, it's, that's it. We are done at this point. And then the type is what the type is and, and has the consequences that it has. And we could do that with a pragma. We could just say, well, whenever you, are, you feel like you want the new reference binding rules, just switch them on. And then anything that's declared while this is on will get the new rules. So here, A would get the old rules, B would get the new rules, and C would get the old rules again. In order to jog a little bit your memory of, of where all these things can occur, where do we actually declare references? Here's the list of, that I came up with um, of where we actually declare them. Of course, there are local and global variables where we say, okay, there's somewhere in the function or at a global level, um, we, we create a reference. Structured binding is the second one, very similar to the first one. 
Of course, there are, very importantly, functions and, and lambda parameter lists. These are the things that are, are quite frequently killing our R value in us now. Uh, remember this min example. There are members that are initialized uh, in, in PODs that are directly initialized. They're not showing up in any, any, uh, any constructor. Then there are the members that are initialized in constructors where any um, reference are, are, references are initialized. And then there are lambda captures. And that's pretty much what I came up with, where we actually declare have references in the code and uh, where we then assign something to it. Now, now we are trying, trying this out, okay? We are saying, okay, we have uh, all the declarations inside this, this pragma um, are gonna follow the new binding rules. And it's gonna be a little bit funny for people who have been programming C++ for a long time, but, but I think it's consistent and it, and, it, and it does what it's supposed to do. So you have an A, which, is, which is how it uses the old rules within const reference. Then we switch on the new binding rules. We declare a B and a C, uh, one for L values and one for R values. And we switch them off again and redeclare the B. At this point, you would probably get an error because you can't say B should follow the new rules and the old rules. Um, that, that's not consistent. So at this point, you probably the, the compiler should probably say no, that, that, that doesn't work. Now, A5 would compile because that is the old rule. Old rule says you can bind R values, but B5 would not work. Um, Although by that time, the new reference binding is already off, but the time we declared it, it was on. So B says, no, to my const reference, you can only bind, R val uh, bind L values, not R values. So that's an error. C would be okay because the five is an R value and it binds to the const ref. ref. And again, if you want to now bind an L value, you declare a variable in A, you want to bind an, an, uh, an L value to the const, reference, uh, const R value reference, that also compiles because they are following new rules. This would not compile in current C++. Um, okay, so what's the impact on the standard library? I think it's not so bad. Um, so you can have a feature test macro if it's currently enabled. Um, the functions that we have, the many functions, are very frequently taking things by constref. So there you're essentially just gonna say, okay, whatever is a constref today is in constant R value reference in the future, you just add another ampersand. Something to get used to, but it, it's equivalent essentially because inside the function body, when you access an R value, it's an L value anyway. So it doesn't make any difference. Now, the only type trait that I found that would be affected is, is the common reference, um, quite obviously, but others, I didn't find anyone, any uh, other type trait that would be affected. Um, now, that's nice, right? But the thing is that we, this is not implemented, so we can't really use that. So I, I didn't do it, maybe someone else will, but until then we have to live with mitigations. We have to find out what, we, what can we do today, now, with the current C++ um, to solve the problem. I already showed you one tool, which is the auto CREF, uh, that will help you a little bit. Um, to essentially get rid of the temporary lifetime extension problem. Uh, we can make sure that member accessors don't have R value qualified access. So we can delete anything, any, any R value qualified, whenever you define an accessor, we define the R value uh, qualified accessor as well and delete it. So we don't accidentally call it on R values. It's a bit cumbersome and maybe we want to have a macro that does it for us. Then uh, we could define our own common reference. So if you, you essentially use the old std common reference, and if we find out that the our old type is an, is an L value reference, but any of the input types are R value references, then we know that there was a magic R value to L value conversion, and then we turn our uh, found common reference type into an R value. We, 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 uh, after the fact, say, oh, you're no longer an L value, you're now an R value reference. With that in place, um, so here's, here's the, uh, the, the, the problem with, with the, right, the R values and L values in a ternary operator, which is currently a const and a copy, which is not nice. Uh, if we use our newly defined common reference, we can actually solve this problem. So we can first cast 
to the common reference type of these the, the two um, the, the two inputs, and and then apply the, the the ternary operator, which will then have two types to deal with, two identical types, and that won't be a problem. Um, so it will just return that type. So now the conditional, for example, from of R and L, uh, when when you are using this macro instead of the plain vanilla ternary operator will be an A const reference and there won't be any copy. It will just give you something that you hopefully know that if you need to store it for a long time, you still need to copy it, but it won't copy it straight away. So that will, that will be uh, probably better than what we currently have. So here's the summary. Um, the const reference probably should never have bound to R values. That was an accident. We can fix C++, but uh, we still have to demonstrate that this actually works. We need an implementation and a large code base that way we successfully tried it on. And until then, we <coughs> have to live with some mitigations that I showed you. Thank you very much, and uh, we, we are hiring, I think so, obviously. All right, thank you. And <laughs> <laughs>